So it is Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. I hope that if your father is still with us, that you have had a phone conversation with him today or that you have had a chance to spend time with him today if he lives close by. And if you haven't been planning to do that, to call him, you need to do that, okay? You need to call him today for those of us who still have fathers who are still with us. My dad is 70 years old, and uh, he spent yesterday working in his pecan tree orchard. He has two or 300 trees on the Chattahoochee River, lost several, several of them to Hurricane Michael last year, but he spent most of the day working, and uh, I don't know about you, but um, my dad's 70 years old, and I think he could outwork me. I think he's probably still stronger than me at 70 years old, and uh, of course, 70 is young. You know, that's not 70, he's not that old, but, um, but I, I don't know if you feel that way growing up, like your dad is is always stronger um, than you, uh, no matter how much older or whatever he gets. But my dad's six foot four. He was uh, the center of his high school football team. He was the catcher for uh, his baseball team in high school growing up, and so uh, he's uh, already a, a strong person. He was um, he was kind of he's a, a, a quiet, and um, for a lot of my friends and uh, some other people, my dad's a little intimidating just because he's quiet, he's serious. Um, um, but, uh, but if you get to know him, you see he's really a very nice person, but, uh, but for me growing up, and I think for my sister too, and, and my little brother, that, um, that you're, you're looked to your father to model strength. Your father models strength for you, not just strength physically, but strength in terms of character, emotional strength, and, uh, and I was blessed to have that model in my dad, and not only do you look for your parents for strength, but I think you want to Reflect that to them, that you want to be strong. Uh, when I was growing up, or uh, when I started, after I graduated high school, I, I worked for uh, a couple summers with my dad's engineering firm, and uh, there was a, a time during the day when my dad and his co-workers, a group of guys, they would have a, a, a break in the middle of the day, I mean, it was before they would start the work day, they'd be kind of a guy, they'd, they'd be reading the paper, and uh, my dad and his co-workers, his friends, uh, they would talk about ball, okay, ball meaning baseball, and uh, several of his, his friends, his co-workers, they had sons who were great baseball players, they were star pitchers on the all-star team completing for state championships, and they'd talk about the latest uh, great pitcher, the game, the, the dr- drama and late innings and all that kind of stuff, and, and uh, I always felt bad because, um, like, my dad couldn't participate in any of those conversations, you know, there was his, he couldn't talk about his son in the all-star game because his son wasn't in the all game. Now, I'm sure he wasn't thinking about that. He probably wasn't thinking about that at all. But I was thinking about that because uh, when I was playing ball, I, when I went three for four one, one night and, and had like th- two or three RBIs and a double, they like signed the game ball and gave it to me. You know, it was kind of that kind of deal. That would tell you that because it never happened. But, um, but uh, so, so sons and I think daughters too want to reflect that strength uh, to their parents, to their fathers, and fathers, you have such an incredible ability to speak life and influence into your children by telling them that you are proud of them. Well, if there was any, ever a parent, a father, who should be proud of his son for feats of strength or fitness or athletic ability, it would be Samson's parents, Samson's father and mother. I mean, Samson was a champion. He was a hero like none other. Samson could do things that ordinary people could not do, incredible things, things that you read them in the Bible and you think, wow, could that actually have happened? Could he actually have done those things? It's unique. Samson is a unique character in the Bible because oftentimes the champion, when it comes to reading the Old Testament, oftentimes the champion is sort of on the other side of the people of Israel. You think about Goliath, who was challenging young David, or you think about Pharaoh, who was oppressing the people of Israel, or Sennacherib, who was the, the emperor, or the ruler of Assyria, who was, who was uh, defying Hezekiah and challenging the city, or Nebuchadnezzar, who carried the uh, uh, people of Judah into exile. All of those were champions or heroes who were opposed to the people of Israel. But Samson was a strong guy who was from Israel, who was on Israel's side. But Samson, in spite of his spirit, strength and being known for being a strong person, a hero, a champion, we see that Samson is a deeply flawed. Samson has glaring weaknesses in spite of his strength. In fact, we could say that while Samson 
has great strength of, of stature or physical strength. What Samson possessed in strength of stature, he lacked in strength of character. And in looking at the, the story of Samson, oftentimes what we remember, what we focus on is Samson's feats of strength. His strength of stature, his physical strength. But we kind of peel back the layers and you look deeper at the story. Is that the story of Samson's character, at least how his character develops and the experiences that we see in the story as we're journeying through this Flex series over four weeks looking at Samson's story, is that it's more about the strength of character or the lack thereof in Samson than about his physical strength. And I think there's a message here for all of us who pride ourselves on the strength of stature or strength as how it is perceived in the eyes of other people. That strength, however that you are given that strength, whether it's in physical ability, whether it's athletic ability, whether it's good looks, whether it's money, whether it's political power, whatever that, that influence that you're given, Whatever that it is, is that while we, if we have those things, there's a danger that's associated with it. And that danger is the danger of insensitivity. Samson's strength leads to insensitivity. Because he has it, because he's got the power, the strength, we see that, that he is ignorant of those who don't, or of other people, or, and especially ignorant to his own weaknesses. In Judges chapter 14, verse 1, we see the, the story of Samson sort of begins. We started last week with the story of Samson's birth, and how he was chosen by God before birth to be an instrument to bring victory for the people of Israel over the Philistines. But in, in Judges chapter 14, Samson kind of makes his appearance as an adult. Okay, And from the beginning... We see that Samson is one who's insensitive, not only to others, but to his own weaknesses and to God. It says that Samson went down to Timnah, and there was a young Philistine woman. Now we're going to see how Samson and his relationship with women was really not very good. Okay, we'll just say it like that. We're going to see more about that next week. It says, when he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah, now get her for me. As my wife. Now, first of all, this was insulting, insensitive to his parents to go to his father and mother and to demand that I want you to get for me this woman as my wife. And and not only that, but Samson's pushing the envelope a little bit to seek a wife from among the Philistines. Not that God's opposed to interracial marriage or anything, it's not about race or anything like that. But it's that the Philistines were outside of the covenant people. And they had a different set of values than the people of Israel, or at least they were supposed to be, though in Samson's day, sometimes it was hard to tell. And so Samson's father and mother come back with this word of advice. They say, isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among all our people? And can't you find someone from among the people of Israel in our tribe? To marry because they have our values. We're part of the, the covenant people, or the people of God, and really it's more about religion here than race. Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? Again, a reference to them being outside the covenant. But Samson said to his father, Get her for me. She's the right one for me. Samson's insensitive to the advice of his father and mother, insensitive to the cultural values, what's going on here. And we have, obviously, that the young woman seems to have no say at all in what's going on, whether or not she marries Samson. I mean, would you want to marry Samson? You know, I I don't know, okay? Samson's impressive as far as his strength, probably his uh, physique, but his character flaws are pretty glaring. Well, uh, Samson's father agrees. I mean, can you say no to Samson? What's he going to do? You know, can you say, so his father and mother agree. And, uh, and so they go to the city of Timnah to make arrangements for the wedding. And on the way, we have kind of this random story. Samson's traveling along, but it demonstrates Samson's strength. It says he's attacked by a lion. 
a lion comes out and attacks him, and it says that Samson kills the lion with his bare hands, and he leaves the dead body on the side of the road, and then he goes on to Timnah, and there the arrangements are made. Well, the next time Samson passes that way, this time to on the way to get married, he passes by and he sees the carcass of the lion is still there. Obviously, this is probably only a few days later at the most. He sees that there is a, a swarm of bees there's a, 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 that have made a hive of honeybees in the carcass of the lion. And Samson, who is a man who seems to be undeterred, who never says no to himself, okay, he, he, see, he, get, he sees what he wants, he takes it. He reaches in and takes some honey from the hive in the carcass of the lion, and he eats it. Which wouldn't be significant, except that Samson was supposed to be a Nazarite. And the Nazarite vow, which is recorded in Numbers chapter 6, was a special vow that people of Israel could make to, to specially dedicate themselves to God. You didn't have to do it, but some people would do it. Which meant that you, you didn't drink wine or alcohol. You didn't drink alcohol. You didn't cut your hair. And you didn't touch dead bodies or carcasses. Now Samson had never taken the Nazarite vow or chosen to take the vow. But he was, his parents were informed by the angel that spoke to them that Samson would be a Nazarite from birth. And so he was set apart to be a Nazarite from his birth, that he was, had a special gift from God, and that it was his calling. He was consecrated. And so for Samson to touch the, the lion's carcass would have been a violation of his consecrated vows or his consecration as a Nazarite. But Samson's not sensitive to that. Samson doesn't pay attention to that. He just knows what he wants, and he has the strength to get it. Well, he goes into Timnah, and there the wedding takes place, and Samson's father-in-law arranges for 30 young men of the city of Timnah to be his attendants, sort of like groomsmen, I guess, in that particular culture. So Samson, who, let's just say he's strong, he knows it, he's insensitive, he knows it, he doesn't have to be nice, he provokes, okay, he torments, he bullies, and just to kind of pick at those attendants, he makes a riddle for them. He says, listen, I'll make a bet with you. And those 30 young guys, okay, they, they take the bet. They, he says, I'm going to make a riddle. I'm going to give you the riddle. And if you can tell me the answer, I will get 30 linen garments, 30 outfits that I will give to each one of you. I'll give each of you a new garment. But if you don't get the answer, you have to give me 30 new outfits. And so, I guess wisely, or really unwisely, whether before even hearing the riddle, they agree to it. They're like, we're game, Samson. All right, tell us your riddle. And so Samson, in chapter 14, verse 14, this is his, he says, out of the east, this is his riddle, okay? You're going to know what it is because I just told you the background story, but they don't know. Out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. And they couldn't give the answer. They don't know the answer. I wonder if, like, the riddle, maybe Samson sees a little bit of himself and that out of the strong, something sweet. Maybe Samson considered himself sweet. You know, that's strong. I don't know. He doesn't seem to be very aware of his own weaknesses. So, but, but so Samson gives this riddle, and it's about getting the honey from the lion, the dead lion, the carcass of the lion. So not only is he insensitive, to the, the Nazarite consecration, the vows, he's bragging about it. He's flaunting it. He's flaunting that he doesn't have to keep God's ways or do, and maybe he's ignorant of, maybe he's not intentionally thinking about it, or maybe he is. I don't have to answer to anybody. Well, of course, these young attendants, they, they don't know, and so to try to get the answer, they don't want to have to give away their, their, their new outfits. You know, they don't want to have to do that. They, were, they cost a lot of money, probably more in value than we would spend going to buy a new outfit today. And so they go to Samson's wife, who's from their hometown. They probably grew up with her. They're probably childhood friends. And, and they say, tell us the answer, this riddle. And she says, I don't know the answer. Samson hasn't even told me. And so she goes to Samson, and, he, and in fact, it gets so much that they say, if you don't tell us the answer, we're going to kill you. And so 
Samson's wife, in fear, goes to Samson to try to get the answer to the riddle. And Samson says, well, I hadn't even told my parents the answer. Why should I tell you? Which is, again, insensitive. I mean, she's your wife. And then you wonder, why does she have to go to Samson to beg for the answer if Samson is her strong defender? I mean, if Samson is your husband and your protector, you don't have to worry about 30 attendants. I mean, Samson can whoop them all, you know? And so there's obviously a rift in their relationship, and so Samson tells her. He tells her the riddle, the answer to the riddle. Which she promptly goes and tells to the attendants. And then when the time comes for the answer, we see in verse 18, it says, Before sunset on the seventh day, they said, I guess they had seven days to come back and give an answer. And the man of the town said to him, What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? They get it. They got the riddle right. So Samson has to pay up. And so Samson immediately knows how they got the answer, because otherwise, how would you have guessed it? Samson said to them, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have solved my riddle. Now, I mean, this was three millennia ago. I don't know if this is a common expression or an insulting expression, but you, it sure looks like it. It sure looks insensitive to refer to his wife in any such of a way. We see Samson's insensitive to his parents, sensitive to his cultural values, insensitive to God and God's commands, and he's insensitive to his wife. And then after this happens, it says that he goes on a rampage. He goes down to Ashkelon, which is a Philistine city. He kills 30 men. He brings their, their garments to give them to the 30 attendants. And then it says he goes back to live with his parents. He doesn't even stay with his wife. And so the father-in-law is so perplexed about this. He says, well, so he just gives the young woman to one of the 30 attendants to be his wife. And Samson hears about this. Of course, he goes back to visit his wife. I guess when he, he just felt the urge, you know. He just felt like, I'm, well, I'm ready to go back and see her again. And he goes back and he says, I'm so sure you hated her. I gave her to somebody else. And so Samson goes on another rampage. And in anger about this, he takes some foxes. He finds foxes and he ties their tails together. This is another incredible thing. And he puts torches in the middle of their tails. And they run through the, the, the wheat fields. And they burn up all the grain of the Philistine fields. And so as a result of this, the Philistines are enraged. And, and they go and burn down the house, killing the father-in-law and Samson's wife, who was given to another man. Killing them. And we're told when Samson hears about this in chapter 15 that he is, he is furious. Verse 7, he says, since you've acted like this, I swear that I won't stop until I get my revenge on you. And he attacked them viciously and slaughtered many of them. Then he went down and stayed in a cave in the rock of Etam. Okay? And so in all of this, Samson has gone to war with the Philistines over personal petty stuff. I mean, not petty, but personal stuff, and in fact, he's wreaked a lot of destruction on the Philistines. So as a result, there's a growing conflict, and so he's gone down to hide in this cave after this victory, at least to try to recoup here and recover. And the people of Judah, who is the tribe in which this territory is, or the people of Israel, they come to Samson, they say, listen, Samson, you've just, you've just made a lot of trouble. You've made the Philistines really mad at us. We want to hand them over to you. We, we want to be done with this. So Samson, said, we, so Samson says, okay, well, you can tie me up and take me to them, but just don't kill me. So they agree. They tie up Samson. And they take him toward the, toward the Philistines, toward a particular uh, city, we're told, in, in, uh, in verse uh, 14, 15. 14, it says, he approached Lehi. So the Philistines come toward him. And here's Samson, he's tied up, okay? His own people have tied him up. To get him over to the Philistines, you kind of wonder what was, it's a very crazy time in Israel's history, okay? We're told it's a time when people just did kind of what was right in their own eyes. And so they see Samson coming toward him and says, The Spirit of the Lord, when he sees them, the Philistines coming, it came powerfully upon Samson. And the ropes on his arms became like charred flax, and the bindings dropped from his hands. So he broke free from those ropes. His, straw, his, feet was, his, his strength was so strong that he broke free. And it says that, it says that finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, he grabbed it and struck down a thousand men. Some of you have heard that story. 
kill a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey. I mean, that sounds like a cartoon. How, how, how does that even happen? Okay. So, Samson wins a great victory over the Philistines, really over personal revenge, just a desire to get back at them. So, in, in spite of his insensitivity, his flaws, glaring deficiencies, God uses Samson to help deliver the people of Israel. And in, fi- in fact, what we're going to learn later is actually it, it spurs a conflict. That the people were sort of accommodating to the Philistines' values. And it spurs a conflict to where the people can separate themselves. We're going to talk more about that in a couple of weeks. But Samson, although his, he, he wins a great victory, we see that his flaws, his deficiencies, are actually going to lead to his downfall. It's going to lead to, to his own fall. And that it's due to his insensitivity. As he's insensitive to others, he just plows over them. He's a bully. God uses him in spite of that, but it leads to a downfall. And that insensitivity is a result of a feeling of self-sufficiency. I mean, he doesn't have to be sensitive to the needs of anybody else because he doesn't need anybody else. I don't need them. Why do I have to care about what they want? I just know what I want, and I'm going to get it. And that self-sufficiency, that feeling that I am the end all, that I can get whatever I want because nobody can compare with me, I mean, that's, that's a result of, that's, dude, that's vanity. Pride. And there's one thing about pride. The, the scripture says is that pride goes before a fall. And so I think there's a warning here for all of us who find ourselves in a place of strength. And if you're in a place of personal strength or career strength, financial strength, relational strength, if you, if you are gifted by God with different abilities, if you, if, you live, if, you have, if you live in the United States of America, you, are, you have more strength and influence and more things available to you than most people in the rest of the world. The vast majority do. I think there's a warning here for us. Is that we don't need to neglect the voices of other people and especially the voice of God. To be attentive to those who are weak. To be sensitive to those who are in a place of where they've been abused. Where those who, who battle with struggles that we may not necessarily struggle with. Or those who... Come from a different background. That doesn't mean that we have to always agree that the solutions are the same or that we see eye to eye, that we're going to see eye to eye, but to at least to have sensitivity and not be cruel and, and, and just to neglect the needs of others. Well, in spite of his flaws, okay, We see that God uses Samson. And he uses him to bring a great victory. And and I think the lesson here is that um, true strength, okay? True strength comes from humility. Okay, pride goes before a fall. If vanity and self-sufficiency lead to insensitivity, true strength comes from humility. Strength of stature has value. But strength of character has more value. It may take more strength to listen than to speak. It take, may take more strength to be kind than to be a bully. It takes more strength sometimes to be sensitive. To be attentive to the needs of others. Than not to be. Because we don't a lot of times recognize how much we need others and need God until we are in a place of need ourselves. A lot of times when things are going great, things are going just like we want it, we're feeling on top of the world, God kind of goes in the back pocket, you know, on the back burner. That is a better word. 
But then when we're in that place of need, suddenly our need for God okay, becomes clear in focus. And that's what happens for Samson. Because even the strongest man in the world, we find out, gets tired. Because after he's defeated a thousand Philistines with a donkey's jawbone, we're told that he gets thirsty, okay? He's thirsty, and there's, no, there's nowhere to find anything to drink. Judges 15, verse 18. He was very thirsty, and Samson cried out to the Lord. That's interesting, because even though Samson's been set apart by God to belong to God from, from birth, from even before he was born, this is the first reference we have of Samson actually crying out to God. Because he was very thirsty, he cried out to the Lord, You have given your servant this great victory. Must I now die of thirst and fall to the hands of the uncircumcised? In other words, he calls out to God, Help me. Samson, the strong man, is in a place of weakness. This is actually foreshadowing something that's going to happen later in Samson's story. And here's what happened. It says that God opened up the hollow place in Lehi, and water came out of it. And when Samson drank, his strength returned and he revived. So that spring was called in Hecore, and it is still there in Lehi. in Hecore means caller's spring. A spring popped out of the ground. And there was water for Samson to drink. And it says, it's actually the first time this word is actually used in the Samson story, though we associate strength with Samson. The first time the tech, the word strength is actually his strength returned. In other words, where does Samson's strength come from? It doesn't come from himself. It comes from God. It's not because he's all that, because he's deserved it, because he's the best, the brightest, the strongest, whatever. It's because of God's Grace, God's gift. And so Samson's strength is renewed after he reaches a place of weakness. Well, God uses Samson. Samson brings about a great victory for the people of Israel in a, in a desperate time for them. And, uh, and our tagline for this series is that Samson is flawed but chosen. He is flawed. His, his character flaws are glaring. But in spite of this, he's chosen. He's chosen by God. We see that from the beginning. Before he is born, the angel speaks that he will, he, is, he will bring about a victory for God's people. And the same way I think this encourages us, okay, because we're flawed too. We mess it up time and time again. We get on the wrong tra track. We're led by our appetites. We we are, we're, lack, we're not sensitive to the needs of others or to God's commands because of feelings of self-sufficiency and vanity. But in spite of this, God used Samson, God chose Samson, and God has chosen you. But I wonder, you can't help but wonder. I mean, the story unfolded like it did, but you can't help but wonder. Could Samson have won an even greater victory? If he'd have been more attentive to his own weaknesses and flaws. If he'd have been a little more sensitive to the needs of others and to God's call in his life. In other words, bringing it to how it might apply to us. What if we combine strength with sensitivity? Our attention is on this, to be strong, or whatever it is that gives us strength, whether it's money, whether it's influence with others, whether it's athletic ability, whether it's good looks, whether it's whatever it is. What if we combined strength with sensitivity? Instead of just looking to those strengths to get what we wanted, what if instead we were attentive and use those strengths for the good of other people. To combine strength with sensitivity. 
Because there is one the Bible describes as having both. As being strong and sensitive. In fact, this one is the strongest of all. No one's stronger than him. He made the heavens and earth. But yet this one always has his eyes toward the weak. Toward the poor. The disadvantaged. Time and time again, God says in the Old Testament, treat the poor with kindness because their maker is me. They, I am their defender. The one who is both strong and sensitive is God. In Isaiah chapter 40, God talks about His greatness. He says, have you not known, have you not heard? I'm the everlasting one. I created the heavens and the earth. There's no one like me, no one who can do what I can do. And then we're told, but in the midst of that, in verse 29, God is described in this way. That He is the one who gives strength to the weary And increases the power of the weak. The strongest one is attentive to the weakest one. What if Samson's story would have been like that? What if our story was like that? Combining strength of resources, strength of capability with sensitivity toward the call of God, the commands of God, and the needs of others. It might just save us from some of the pitfalls along the way when we're not blind to our faults and blinded from the dangers ahead. Because we're going to discover that Samson is blind And he will be literally blinded as we pick up the story next Sunday in Flicks.